Welcome back to Face the Nation. As the Democratic race moves on to South Carolina, that primary will be held next Saturday. We have a CBS News battleground tracker out this morning, and it shows former Vice President Joe Biden on top of the field there with 28 percent support of likely Democratic primary voters. He's leading, but that's a 17 point drop since our last South Carolina poll in November. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders is not far behind with 23 percent support. Billionaire Tom Steyer, who has flooded the local airwaves with ads, is at 18. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren is next with 12 percent, followed by former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg at 10. And Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar is at 4 percent. Former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg is not on the ballot. Anthony Salvanto here to explain all these numbers. What more can you tell us about how the primary is shaping up? So underneath that shrinking lead for Joe Biden you just described is two big things. One is, while he's still on top with African-American voters who will make up most of the Democrats in this primary, that lead is so much smaller now. And he's got to share a lot of that support now with Bernie Sanders and with Tom Steyer. Also, when you look at who black voters think understands their concerns, well, that's still Joe Biden, but it's also increasingly Bernie Sanders, they say, and also Tom Steyer. The other part of this is, frankly, not winning. This is the mechanics of momentum that all the pundits talk about. Voters in South Carolina say they think it's less likely that Joe Biden will ultimately win the Democratic nomination. So that makes them start to look at other candidates and think, okay, what is it that those voters in those other states know that we should maybe reassess? That's South Carolina. Let's look at what's happening nationwide. Uh, right now, Bernie Sanders is on top with 28 percent support of likely Democratic primary voters. Elizabeth Warren comes in behind him with 19 percent, followed by former Vice President Biden at 17. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg is sitting out the first four contests, of course. He comes in at 13 percent support, though. Pete Buttigieg is next with 10 percent. Amy Klobuchar has five. Tom Steyer has two. So nationwide, Bernie Sanders is still beating out Joe Biden. Yeah, he is, and he wasn't always. But this was even done before last night's big win for Sanders in Nevada. So a couple of things happened here. One is the electability argument. Voters look at what's happening in these states and say, who do they think can put together a coalition that can win? We see that while Joe Biden is still widely seen as having a chance to beat President Trump, Bernie Sanders also is, and quite frankly, when Democrats and others look at a matchup against President Trump across the whole electorate, well, it's tight for all of these Democrats. For Joe Biden, for Bernie Sanders, narrow leads at best over the president, really within the margin of error across all voters. But the candidates get a chance to throw some elbows and distinguish themselves on the debate stage on Tuesday. That'll be right here on CBS. Uh, who succeeds in that arena? Well, debates matter, and voters in this poll have told us that debates matter. One example right there is Elizabeth Warren, who's still doing okay nationally. People told us that they thought her debate performance last time was most impressive, and that could be helping bolster her at least national support. And you also look at, by comparison, Joe Biden's debate ranking was lower than that. So there's a lot of pressure on these candidates heading into that Tuesday debate. All right, Anthony Salvanto, thank you very much. And now we turn to our political correspondent, Ed O'Keefe, who is out in Las Vegas getting ready to head to South Carolina. Ed, good morning to you. Uh, what does Joe Biden need to do to challenge Sanders' frontrunner status? He needs to win South Carolina, bottom line. He will spend the whole week in the Palmetto State trying to make the argument that he is best positioned to defeat President Trump, that he can build the multiracial, multigenerational coalition to do it. But the numbers here in Nevada prove he's going to struggle with that. He had an interesting line last night that we're going to hear a lot more of aides tell me. He said, I'm not a socialist, I'm not a plutocrat, I'm a Democrat, trying to make the argument that he best represents what the party wants to do in defeating President Trump. Well, we know Michael Bloomberg is still not on the ballot, but he is going to be in South Carolina on the debate stage Tuesday. How does he need to prepare for that? 
Well, his aides say that they will continue to try to keep the focus on Sanders and make the argument that it would be dangerous for Democrats to nominate him because he wouldn't necessarily be able to attract the kind of independent and potentially disgruntled Republican voters that the Democrats will need in order to win back the White House. But he's going to continue to face questions about his business practices and his decision to release at least three employees from their non-disclosure agreements. Elizabeth Warren especially continues to hammer away at him, and it appears to be working at least from a financial sense. She's been able to raise a lot of money since that debate where she attacked him, and there's evidence from the results in Nevada that her debate performance there may have helped her. Remember, in the next few days, most of these candidates will be campaigning not just in South Carolina, but in the 14 other states voting on Super Tuesday. Texas, North Carolina, North Dakota, Arkansas, Colorado, they won't all be in South Carolina this week because they know there are huge prizes to be won on March 3rd, just three days after South Carolina. All right, Ed O'Keefe on the ground in Las Vegas, and we'll be seeing you in South Carolina soon, Ed. Thank you. We'll be right back with more from our interview with former Vice President Joe Biden. We're back with more of our interview with former Vice President Joe Biden. Afghanistan. Yes. There is a plan in place for a deal to be signed at the end of the month after this pause in violence or reduction in violence. I remember when the Obama administration sought a deal with the Taliban. The Trump administration is now on the verge of signing one. Um, Which we know nothing about. Look, I opposed the surge in the first place, number one. I didn't think we should have even the troops we sent there. Now, it's all been made public now that we should have the troops we, in the first place that were sent there. And I don't even think we should have added the number of troops, which is considerably less than the president, this, this mm -hmm. president added. I think we should only have troops there to make sure that it's impossible for the Taliban, Ashkir, or ISIS or Al-Qaeda to reestablish a foothold there to be able to go from Afghanistan to the United States to attack the United States. That requires a much smaller footprint. But as I understand it, we're not drawing down to a level that was even as low as it was when we left Afghanistan. About 8,600 is the yeah. number of troops. And so we'll see. I mean, it's a little premature to make the judgment whether or not this is a good deal or not a good deal. But as you just said in the course of your answer there, you do think there should be some U.S. presence that remains yes, in Afghanistan? Yes, a very small presence to be able to determine whether or not. I mean, a small footprint. What does that look like? It look, looks American? like several thousand people mm -hmm. to make sure that we have a place from which we can operate if, in fact, you find that there's a, re, uh, a massing of Taliban capacity, I mean, excuse me, of al-Qaeda and or uh, ISIS capacity to strike the United States like happened in 9-11. The Washington Post quoted you this week in a story about Afghanistan, saying that back in 2010, you said to Richard Holbrook, the then envoy, I'm not sending my boy back there to risk his life on behalf of women's rights. It just won't work, not what we're there for. Is that how you remember it? Yeah, what did you mean? What I meant was there's a thousand places we could go to deal with injustice. I can think of Ten countries where women and or children and or people are being are, are being persecuted or being hurt. But the idea of us going to be able to as use our armed forces to solve every single internal problem that exists throughout the world is not within our capacity. The question is, is America's vital self-interest at stake or the vital self-interest of one of our allies at stake? And the fact that they have a system in Afghanistan, as they do in parts of Pakistan, as they do in parts of other countries, that we're going to send troops to because there is not a, a human rights are not being valued to the same degree that we are. That's a different story about sending combat troops. We should call it out. We should go to the United Nations. We should be saying this is what's happening. We should try to shame and get the world to put pressure on and economic pressure on people who engage countries that engage in that. But not send troops. That's what I meant. It is not sufficient. That was my point. And the idea was, and I think Richard had said something like, well, women are being abused there. I said, they're being abused a lot of places around the world. Are we going to send our American forces all over the world to make sure that stops? But then don't you bear some responsibility for the outcome if the Taliban ends up back in control and women end up losing the no, rights? No, I don't. Look, are you telling me that we should go into China because go to war with China because what they're doing to the Uyghurs, a million Uyghurs in the, out in the West in concentration camps? Is that what you're saying to me? 
It was your quote, sir. I was asking you. No, what you I know. Meant. I gave you my. I gave the answer. You do I bear responsibility? Zero responsibility. Mm -hmm. The responsibility I have is to protect America's na national self-interest and not put our women and men in harm's way to try to solve every single problem in the world by use of force. That's my responsibility as president, and that's what I'll do as president. We'll be right back with our political panel. It's time now for some political analysis from our panel. Susan Page is the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today. Lonnie Chen is a Republican policy advisor and fellow at the Hoover Institution. Dan Balls is chief correspondent at the Washington Post. And Jamel Bowie is the CBS News political analyst and a columnist with the New York Times. Good to have you all here. Lonnie, I want to start on the fundamental basis of what is central to our democracy, which is that our election process actually works. And undermining faith in the integrity of the election is a massive risk. I think everyone can agree on that. What we have heard in the past few days, I think is frankly confusing. Um, and National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said not just that he had not seen the underlying intelligence that Russia was intervening with a preference for Trump, but also that he had never received a briefing to that effect. He also told us, told us in our interview that the FBI did tell him that Russia was interviewing, intervening to help Sanders. This morning, Trump says he was never told that. What should Americans at home understand from this? Because bottom line, isn't the national security advisor's job to say our elections will be protected no matter who is interfering and no matter whom they're interfering on behalf of? Yeah, look, I, I think he said that at the end. I think he made the point that regardless of who's doing this or what they might be trying to do, it is the job of this administration to protect the integrity of the election process and the integrity of our democratic process. But, you know, I think some of the confusion that's arising is because they're, they're, they're trying to turn things on, on very specific indications of what did and did not happen. For example, the administration is saying that the president may not have been briefed on the underlying intelligence. But surely the president was provided with some interpretation, perhaps, of that data. And so what they're trying to say maybe is that he hasn't seen the underlying evidence. Now, that may which be true. Which is not unusual. Which is not unusual. And that may be true. But I think the, what we really could benefit from here is some clarity in right. terms of exactly what the intelligence community is seeing. If they are helping Bernie Sanders, and that is a, a, an assessment that they are comfortable with, I think that's something that should be shared. And if there's any confusion, I do think that O'Brien's point was right, which is the underlying intelligence ought to be declassified. So we can see that. The American well, actually, people- Actually, that was my point. Uh, your, your point, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said he Good couldn't point. do that. Good point then, <laughs> because, because, because then that will give the American people some comfort about what's actually going on. I do think there's confusion right now. There's no question that there's confusion right now. Yeah. You know who benefits from confusion? Russia, because if they, they may want Trump reelected, they may want Sanders nominated and elected. What they mostly want is for us not to believe that we're going to have a free and fair election that we can trust. And they are succeeding on that front. And Dan, it was your paper, The Washington Post, that reported Russia is attempting to help Sanders' presidential campaign as part of an effort to interfere with the Democratic contest. Um, what is unusual is to have the National Security Advisor Talk about this in a political context. Um, and there was reaction to O'Brien commenting in this way. It's unusual for someone in that position to do so. Well, it's not just unusual. It's, it's, uh, it's supposedly not allowed. I mean, the National Security Advisor uh, is supposed to be uh, an official who's dealing only in the national security realm and not involved in partisan politics. Um, and so any, any suggestion or anything that comes from him that puts him into that realm undermines the role that he's supposed to be playing. Jamel, I mean, the theory uh, of the case here, as, as Susan was saying, is that division, confusion, that's the end game in and of itself. It's not having the Manchurian candidate per right. se. Right. It's just getting people to doubt that the systems and institutions are actually functioning. Can Democrats... Um, form a united front here, or are they falling prey to some of this? Because you heard it bubble up a little bit in that Biden interview as well, where he said, I don't buy that these are, you know, Russian bots interfering and spreading hate online, that 
Senator Sanders is responsible for some of it. I think the first step Democrats have to do is do what Senator Sanders said when he was told or was asked to comment publicly about this, to disavow uh, the interference, to uh, say that if he's elected president, uh, he will reject uh, anything like this and try to stop any kind of election interference into the country. And then as far as the entire Democratic Party goes, I, I think there needs to be sort of two things going on. First, yes, an awareness that online and other forums there may be Russian hackers, trolls trying to stir up things, but it's probably not wise to immediately lean on that as your explanation um, for the specific reason that it does undermine people's faith in what's happening. Uh, on, on the question of online division, maybe that does require all candidates, right, to say anyone in our camp doing these things needs to cut it out, which is what the candidates have been saying. Uh, but I would recommend specifically for this problem of maintaining faith in the process to not immediately jump to, well, it's Russian bots, it's Russian hackers, because that, I think, uh, does sow mistrust and uh, a little bit of fear. Well, one of the things that makes Sanders, um, you know, a, a candidate who is controversial, uh, you know, certainly starkly in contrast to Joe Biden and what he describes there, um, is also some of his rhetoric. He tweeted and got some guff for it this week. I've got news for the Republican establishment. I've got news for the Democratic establishment. They can't stop us. That was seen as not a message of unity for the party, but one of this is an insurgency, right. which is divisive. It is divisive. I'm not sure. I guess my perspective on these sorts of things is informed by previous election cycles, which is compared to some of the language that emerged in 2016 or 2008 or 2004. It's not that divisive, right? I, I distinctly remember in the 2008 Democratic primary, the candidates Clinton and Obama throwing extremely hard punches at each other, saying things that in the moment made it feel like there may not be unity once the primary ended. But what happened was unity. The party got back together. So Sanders calling out the Republican establishment, the Democratic establishment, that's sort of been his brand as right. a national politician. And I don't think relative to past contests, or even relative to this contest, is all that divisive. Um, I see this as just part of uh, everyone's brand management when it comes to the role they're playing in this primary. I mean, I, I think it's quite divisive in the sense that he's speaking to his base. That's who he's communicating to. He's communicating to his supporters. And we've seen this movie before, by the way, in terms of how candidates communicate with the people who support them. His message is to his supporters to say, look, you know, you've been ignored, you've been marginalized, no longer I will be your voice, I alone can do this. We've heard this rhetoric before, so I think it is incredibly divisive for Senator Sanders to engage in that. And, and the Democratic establishment needs to wake up on this. If they're going to stop Bernie Sanders, or they're going to figure out some way to make sure he isn't the nominee, that needs to start today. Not after South Carolina, not after Super Tuesday, it needs to start today. And by the way, Mike Bloomberg could easily engage in this activity. He could turn all of his advertising against Bernie Sanders tomorrow if he wanted to. And that's the only way there's a difference made in this race, I think. You know, it's true, though. It may be divisive or not, but it is an accurate depiction of what we see happening. And you, you mentioned kind of the eerie parallels to the 2016 race on the Republican side, where you had a very controversial candidate. You had a wide field that was much more acceptable to the party establishment that fought with each other and divided the, the other side of the, and created this path for Donald Trump to win the nomination. And that is what, what we see now happening, I think, with the Democrats and with with Bernie Sanders. And the, and the only company Comfort for Democrats, I think, is a lot of Democrats don't think Bernie Sanders can win at a national election. A lot of Republicans didn't think Donald Trump could either last time around. I think. Well, Bernie, Sa excuse me, sorry. Uh, Joe Biden, Dan, um, is making the argument for the good of the party that someone like him, he'd prefer him, should be the candidate, <laughs> not just for the Oval Office, but because of all the down ballot races, essentially warning that Democrats are going to lose all leverage or influence or a majority, certainly in, in, in the House, uh, and, if they don't go with a more establishment candidate. Right, and that argument is going to be amped up this week in South Carolina and ahead of Super Tuesday. Uh, but, to, but to your point about the Democratic establishment needs to get together, we saw in 2016 that there is no way that an establishment, quote unquote, within a party can do that. I mean, what it requires is sacrifice on the part of candidates who are now in the race to say, you know what, for the good of 
the cause, I'm going to step aside. Well, which among these candidates is going to do that other than people who perform so woefully in South Carolina on Super Tuesday that they're essentially driven out of the race? Well, we got that call this week from Mike Bloomberg, Jamal, uh, in that leaked memo. Right, right. Um, I, I can't imagine... The, pe the kinds of people who run for president, right, are not the kinds of people who are going to say to themselves, well, I guess for the good of the party and, and you know, the someone else's political prospects, I'm going to drop out to make sure that this candidate I don't think can win, can win. Um, I, I think it's worth saying uh, in that regards um, that the analogy to Trump falls apart uh, when it comes to Trump's favorability within the Republican Party at this stage of the race. Um, Sanders, at the last poll I saw, 76% of Democrats have a favorable view of Sanders. That's higher than any other candidate in the race. Um, and s for all the talk of reconstituting the Obama coalition, which has kind of been the drumbeat among Democrats mm -hmm. for the past three years, Sanders seems to be the one doing it, right? We, see, we saw this in Nevada, pulling together a coalition of union households, of uh, minority voters, of working class voters, of young voters, uh, into something that looks like potentially an electoral juggernaut. So. I, I sort of think the certainty among the Democratic establishment, such that it is, that Sanders is unelectable, runs into the fact that looking at what we know so far, he appears to be quite electable um, based on the measures we use for everyone else. Lonnie, I, I want to ask you about someone you know who you worked with in a prior campaign, and that is Rick Grinnell, mm -hmm. the current ambassador to Germany who has stepped into the director of national intelligence role. He has no intelligence background. What do you think of his appointment to that job at this moment? Well, you know, the president puts people around him who he's comfortable with, who he believes will be loyal to him. Uh, the president has that prerogative, by the way. You know, it's not clear to me that this is going to be the permanent appointment. I would say that there are a number of people who probably would be a better permanent appointment than, than Rick Grinnell. But look, he has national security experience, not like he doesn't have any at all. You're right, he doesn't have any intelligence community experience. So I think at this point in time, the president might be better served with someone who has that experience. But to me, this is a reflection of how the president has staffed his administration all along. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us this week. And we will be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you all for watching. And be sure to tune in tomorrow to CBS This Morning. Gail King will be talking to South Carolina Republican Senator Tim Scott. Gail is in Charleston ahead of our CBS News Democratic debate, along with Nora O'Donnell, Major Garrett, Bill Whitaker of 60 Minutes, and I'm heading down there myself to join them. Our debate is Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Hope you'll join us. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.